Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm John Bolin, President Emeritus of KQED Public Media and Vice Chair of the Commonwealth Club Board of Governors, and I'll be moderating today's program. I'm pleased to be joined by Mark Bowden and Matthew Teague, authors of the new book, The Steal, the attempt to overturn the 2020 election and the people who stopped it. Mark Bowden is a contributing writer for The Atlantic, and his previous books include the bestseller, Black Hawk Down. Matthew Teague is a contributor for National Geographic, The Atlantic, and Esquire, and his personal story is told in his 2015 piece, The Friend, Love is Not a Big Enough Word, was adapted into the 2019 movie, Our Friend. The Steel is a compelling saga of the 64 days between Election Day, November 3rd, 2020, and January 6, 2021. Our guests reveal never before told accounts from the election officials fighting to do their jobs amid outlandish claims and threats to themselves, their colleagues, and their families. And what happened during those crucial nine weeks when they did their duty and stood firm against the unprecedented sustained attack on our election system. We'll be discussing a lot in the next hour and I wanna ask Mark and Matthew your questions as well. If you're watching along with us, please put your questions into the text chat on YouTube, and we'll be getting to them later in the program. Thank you, Mark Bowden and Matthew Teague for joining us. Thanks for, having Thanks for inviting us, John. You've taken an interesting approach to covering the critical couple months after the election. The action takes place in six states, Arizona, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Wisconsin, Nevada, and Michigan, which is where the critical battles over the vote were fought and it includes a cast of 60 characters. While some of the characters are obviously names we know, like Trump and Barr and Giuliani, the stars of the story are regular people in local communities battling over the legitimacy of the vote. They are local officials charged with overseeing the vote, local politicians and regular citizens who became deeply involved. How did you decide to take this approach and structure the story this way? Mark, you want to take that? Sure. You know, I think Matt and I both knew that the um, that there would be a lot of attention focused on January 6th, the riot that attacked the Capitol, and that that was going to be written about and very thoroughly investigated. And we felt that it was more important uh, to understand why that happened and how, and also that the more serious threat, I think, to our election in 2020 was the concerted effort mounted by Trump and his team in these six swing states where they tried to pressure election officials into falsifying the vote, where they tried to pressure state legislators into refusing to certify the vote or, or to send Trump electors to Washington instead of Biden electors in places where Biden had clearly won. And so that we felt was really the more serious threat posed by this effort. And it was also the human story. This was the story of the people on the front lines, both those attacking the vote and those who, who were trying to defend it. So we felt that was the more important story and, and, and frankly would be a more compelling story. So that's where we focused our efforts. And how to, and, I, and that did make it really much more compelling than, than a typical political story because they really are real people. Uh, how did you find the characters and why did they cooperate with you? Because they seem to cooperate extensively. Yeah. Well, I think we just looked for um, pivotal stories in the places that mattered most in the, the battleground states that you mentioned. Uh, we looked for people who had taken a stand, um, who had sort of uh, played an important role. And to our surprise, we didn't plan this, uh, it often ended up being Republicans who acted heroically and even Trump supporters. It's just that they had the information, they knew the facts, they were part of the process. And so 
they were willing to recognize disinformation when they saw it and stand up and say, no, that's not true. Um, so those ended up being the people that we focused on. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. I, I was really surprised that it's basically a story of Republicans. There are very few Democrats uh, who are in the cast of characters, and they're battling each other over the vote. And many of them were ardent Trump supporters. So it, it's very much this Republican versus Republican story versus Republican versus Democrat. Did that surprise you when you when you started looking into this? Well, it shouldn't have surprised us that much, John, but it, I think it did. Uh, and the reason it shouldn't have surprised us is that the, the reason these swing states are swing states is that the vote is close there. And in many of these states um, and counties, you have uh, as many Republican leaders as you have Democrats. And so I think, frankly, that the effort was targeting Republicans primarily because they were perceived as the ones most likely to be willing to go along with this effort to overturn the election. And it turned out that in every instance, uh, the Republican local officials uh, who had the actual responsibility, and as Matt says, who had the knowledge because they had actually worked on the election, refused to be bullied or cajoled into doing anything other than what they felt was right. And so I think we do end up with profiles and courage, uh, people who I think did the right thing at a very difficult time. Yeah, what was also interesting to me is people on both sides of these battles considered themselves patriots. Uh, the first character we meet, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly, is named Lee Hoops uh, in Pennsylvania. And I just want to read a paragraph from the book that I found very informative in terms of this view of patriotism. Her use of the word patriot signified allegiance to a particular idea of America, one in tune with God, with the nation's common sense core, where men were men and women were women where justice meant protecting health and home and cherished values, where the heroic stories of American greatness learned in elementary school remain true, where folks lived and earned and thrived free of meddling government and so-called experts, where the old usually trumped the new, where gut feelings counted for more than science, where good people were free to carry guns to protect themselves from bad people, where America was respected worldwide and its power feared. Many of the people fighting, fighting to uh, protect the integrity of the election had that very same view of America. They were you know, strong Trump supporters. How did they end up on opposing sides? These people who have a very similar worldview, live in the same community, members of the same party, voting for the same candidate, and yet ended up in terrible battles. It's a contest between what people want to believe and then what they come to know is true uh, if they're involved in the process. On one side, uh, people were confident um, that the, the leaders that they had elected uh, would not lie to them and that they were on the right side and uh, all that sort of thing. But that's, you know, a, a confidence game depends on that confidence. Um, on the other side were the people with the actual facts, the people with, as Mark said, the knowledge, because they had been involved in counting votes, opening envelopes, watching polls, things like that, and were able to say, you know, what we're being sold here is, is not true. Um, and so that set up a conflict between people who were ostensibly on the same side. Yeah, a good example of that, John, is uh, Dean Knudsen, who was chairman of the board uh, or of the election committee in Wisconsin. And Dean had been involved in running elections in Wisconsin for decades. He had uh, taken part in some of the reforms that were enacted under Republican Governor Scott Walker. So he was steeped in the mechanics of the election, which are complex. I mean, I think it's actually one of the things I discovered in working on this book is it's a little just short of a miracle that every two years we hold these national elections, which are held in every neighborhood and every community all over the country, often with different rules, different machines, and yet we somehow you know, managed to coordinate all that. Well, Dean Knudsen knew that system inside and out. So even before election day in Wisconsin in 2020, 
when Donald Trump started disparaging mail-in votes, Dean Knudsen knew that if he was discouraging Republican voters in Wisconsin, as many areas of Wisconsin are rural, that they were going to undercut their chances. The Republicans were going to undercut their chances to, to win in Wisconsin. Uh, and so he started you know, encouraging people uh, to send in their ballots early and became the focus even before election day of attacks by Trump and his people for, uh, be, for betraying you know, the Trump cause. And what he was doing was he was trying to help. <laughs> he was trying to help Republicans win the election. And he knew darn well that in discouraging people from voting by mail was really going to cut the Republicans' throat in that election. Yeah, the book really is a window into the process at the local level, which, you know, all kinds of different envelopes and images being taken and machinery and some cases, you know, computer machinery and some cases not. Um, there was a huge increase, obviously, in mail-in voting. Talk a little bit more about the impact that had on both the result of the election, Biden's victory, uh, and this whole process of the steal and, and trying to you know, upend the election. How, much, how, how, how big a factor was mail-in voting to the whole mess? Well, I'll, I'll take it, I guess. Uh, I think we all watched it unfold on election night. Um, it started with um, Trump taking an early lead on election night. Um, and of course, behind that came a wave of, of blue votes as, as the people counting the votes moved through in-person votes and started to open the envelopes from the mail-in votes. Um, many more Democratic voters had mailed in their votes. And knowing this, I think Trump's uh, uh, team sort of declared an early victory. We, we did it, we won. Um, and so that it seemed as though something um, untoward had happened when suddenly, as people said many times, in the middle of the night, um, you know, all these votes came in for Biden. Well, it's just that later in the evening, they were opening envelopes. Um, and so it created a sort of uh, strange dynamic uh, in the course of, of, of election night. Yeah, the optics were bad because as Matt says, you know, if you look at the in-person vote, voting results, they tell you one thing, um, but in fact, it takes longer to count mailed in ballots. And in a way, you know, I think Trump did seriously hurt himself all over the country by discouraging Republican voters from sending in their votes by mail. There's absolutely no indication that um, mail ballots are somehow more susceptible to fraud than in-person voting because there's all kinds of backups. There's a physical record and a digital record which can be compared to one another. So there's really not um, anything inherently uh, uh, been, you know, un imbalanced in mail votes versus in-person votes. But I do think to the extent that Donald Trump discouraged Republicans from sending in their votes by mail, he pretty much guaranteed that the bulk of those mail votes would be coming from Democrats. And, and so that's in fact what we saw. And so they tried to use that to further the narrative that the election had been stolen, but this had been predicted. Uh, you know, experts watching the election prior to election day predicted that we would see a wave of, of Democrat votes that would come in by mail. And, and it isn't that that's counter to tradition. I, I believe that Republicans usually benefited from mail-in voting prior to this in a lot of states. Well, yeah, except that in past elections, the number of mailed in votes was very small. I mean, basically prior to the pandemic, people who voted by mail were members of the service and, and military, you know, military people do tend demographically to be more Republican and Democrat, Dem Democratic. But the number of those votes sent in by service members overseas who were not able to vote in person and you know the elderly and infirm who were uh, unable to get to the polls in person, th these were always a, a very, very small portion of you know, any, any election. It, that really changed in the pandemic. Do you, uh, just a quick question as an aside, do you know, are they ro rolling back the massive 
mail-in efforts in states now for the 2022 election, or are a lot of those measures going to be left in place? Well, I think it prob probably they will be rolled back because uh, I think it's probably fair to say that anything that makes voting easier probably benefits Democrats generally. Uh, anything that makes it a little more di more difficult to vote tends to favor Republicans. So I don't know of any specific examples. I will say that in all of the states, and it was virtually all the states where mail-in balloting was um, uh, encouraged and widened, uh, that was a bipartisan effort, both Democrats and Republicans, right up until the point where Trump started making his argument that mail-in mail voting was somehow uh, tainted. Uh, both Democrats and Republicans uh, saw the wisdom in making it easier for people to vote during the pandemic. You know, the book confirms something we probably knew, and that is any dissent or disagreement with Trump is punished. And I was particularly sort of shocked, I think, uh, by the postmaster in Erie, Pennsylvania, who was like an ardent Trump supporter, was really abused terribly just for doing his job. Is there any long-term effect of this on the party? I mean, is there any split in the Republican Party that we're not seeing on the surface of people who have been, you know, good people who have been hurt uh, and have networks of their own? I just, you, you just seem to hear on the surface that it's just all unified under Trump. That's to be long-term effects that won't be apparent until the long term gets here, you know, we're, we're still in fairly early days. But I think about, for instance, something that happened in Georgia was that uh, they, they analyzed the ballots uh, after the election. It took a little time, but what they found was that 28,000 people voted down ballot, but not for the presidential candidate in Georgia. Normally, it's the other way around. People vote for the president and they skip the local stuff. Um, and that's particularly important in Georgia because it's the place where, if you remember, Trump made his famous phone call to the Secretary of State saying, I want you to find me 11,000 some odd votes because that was the margin he had lost by. So if 28,000 people were turned off uh, by this behavior enough to sort of split away from you know uh, unity with the, the president that their party had put forward, he could have won. He could have won the state of Georgia. It was a really crucial state. So I think there are a lot of people, um, at least an important percentage of people, who are recognizing with something and something isn't right here, um, and will hold to the truth. I do think too, John, that um, because election workers, people who usually have kind of boring, low-paying or no-paying positions, they're basically doing these jobs as a public service, and we're not ever really paid much attention to, they came under attack, you know, in, after this election. Some of them, as we record in the book, went into hiding, okay. received death threats, people banging on their front door. Clint Hickman in, in Maricopa County, which is in Phoenix in Arizona, had, you know, demonstrators on the front door out in front of his house, you know, calling for his arrest. Some people calling for, you know, their local elected officials to be executed because they failed to march in step with Donald Trump. So I do think that you will find and we're finding that uh, people might be a little bit more reluctant to uh, step up and do these jobs. And in some places, you know, I think the Trumpists have been running candidates to take over these these local votes. I'm a little bit I mean, I think that piece of it is true. But one of the other things we discovered is that uh, people are not cowards for the most part. And so while some people you know, might be discouraged from taking part, I think an equal number of people might be encouraged to step up, realizing that you know, this is an important job and we shouldn't turn this over to hacks. We should, these should be run by people with integrity who, are, you know, who believe in the American electoral system. So there are a lot of quotation marks in the book. Uh, many conversations and phone calls with multiple participants. Just one example that I, I thought was really compelling was sort of a verbatim account of the interrogation of that postal worker by the postal service inspectors. 
how did you research to get the details on all these conversations that really drive the drive the the drama of the story forward? That particular interrogation was posted online by somebody who who thought that uh, they it was a strike against the government uh, when actually it shows that the interrogators were <laughs> completely really went out of their way. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it, it was, it didn't work the way I think they planned for it to, but that's, I think an artifact of our time now is that uh, conversations, um, uh, appearances in public rallies, riots, uh, phones, all of it is recorded in some way. And so we were able to sort of mine that to get as uh, much detail as we could into the book. And I should add, we had a, a great team of researchers uh, helping yes. us, young, young reporters and researchers who dug up all this stuff. We had one of the young women who worked with us created a, a media chronology, basically, so that we could go to any day in these 63 days and call up TV shows, uh, recorded events, people who had posted things online and watched all of it. And as Matt says, you know, this is an interesting uh, thing for reporters. I've been a nonfiction writer for almost 40, 50 years. And when I started out as a reporter, if, if I had a still photograph of an event, that was something useful to me as a reporter because it was something that was not at least on its face, a point of contention. I could see exactly what happened in that picture. And nowadays, more often than not, you know, we have video and audio of events as they unfold, even, you know, in, in local races, um, often before we have even un an understanding of what, what it's about. So I find that with everything that I write nowadays, uh, I'm often basing a lot of the, the stories that I tell on uh, on the on the actual record because it's out there. Have you had any reaction from from the folks who are the characters in this in this story? Uh, have you heard from them how they feel about how they were portrayed or how they were quoted? Any feedback you've gotten? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I've actually become kind of buddies with uh, people like Clint Hickman in Arizona and Ron Bishop and in Wisconsin. I think the people, as you might expect, who think, uh, who are happy with their portrayal have been, uh, you know, have, have reached out so far. I haven't heard from some of the folks who, uh, who don't come off quite as well. But I will say that, you know, at the outset, as I, I've done this for a long time, and I usually tell people uh, before I interview them that um, they may not end up liking the story or the book that I write, but I promise them that they will be presented as they are. And because of audio, video, because you can dial back, you know, someone's social media to a particular day, you know, in the past, you don't have to use your imagination to figure out what they were thinking and what they were saying on a particular day. It's right there for everybody to see. So while I'm sure some people maybe are feeling a little uncomfortable about what they said and what they did. Uh, they aren't letting us know about it if they are uncomfortable. And I, I frankly think in most cases are such true believers that regardless of the context that we present in the book, I doubt it will change uh, their perspective of themselves or what they did. I've heard from several people too, particularly from Georgia. And I think the reason that, that people are grateful for the book is that when you're standing up to something like this, when the most powerful man in the world is calling you names and <laughs> calling you a criminal and things like that, I think one way you get through that is to say, well, history will set things straight. In time, this will become known, the truth of what I'm doing here. And so I think uh, that our book is, is a, an attempt to add to that in a way that, that people recognize. Were both sides, the ones who believed the election was stolen and those who, uh, you know, defended the integrity of the vote, cooperative? I mean, were you able to get just about everybody to cooperate with you? Just about, you know, I found that the hardest nut to crack, frankly, were local officials who had come under such attack, you know, during the election that by the time we were 
reporting this book, things for them had finally kind of quieted down. And so they were really reluctant in many cases to open that door again, not knowing you know, exactly how they would be portrayed in, in what we wrote. Uh, but there were, that was actually um, a, a minority of the people that we reached out to. I find, you know, <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time and people often say to me, Mark, how did you get this person to talk to you? And the answer is usually I showed up, you know, yeah. I, I called them and asked because, you know, most people are very eager to tell their stories. And if you can convince them that you don't have an agenda, that you are genuinely interested in what they did and what they thought and what they said, uh, they'll open up and they'll, and they'll tell you. And I actually, now that I think of it, the Trumpists probably are happy to talk to anyone in their, in their proselytizing of, uh, yeah. you know, what they I found, you know, that in some cases I, I had to sort of gracefully try to back out of the conversation after a couple of hours because I had everything that I could possibly need and, uh, you know, I, and I would just sort of say, well, gosh, thanks, you know, for, for giving me so much, so much more than I thought I could get. Uh, but, you know, people love to talk about themselves and their ideas. And so that wasn't all that hard. So just as Trump seems to believe he is always right, and he insists he simply could not have lost the election, his followers were also firm in their belief that the election was stolen to, despite, despite being presented with facts, obviously. Were any minds changed? Do you have any stories of a Trump person who after seeing the evidence or talking with their election official or whatever, you know, came over to the other side and their thoughts about the election? Did the facts matter to anyone? I think facts mattered, but I think, um at least in, in my experience of talking to people, um, the, <laughs> the facts had to be there first. Anybody who was sort of given facts after the fact had already closed themselves off to some degree to those things. Um, so that people who were involved in the process, I, I'm thinking of Cheryl Guy, who's a county clerk in Antrim County, Michigan, who made a small mistake in her tabulation oh, yeah. of the votes and was seized upon um, by this enormous sort of political uh, drama and uh, private jets arriving in the night, people coming and going through our office, things like that. She was a Trump supporter. And so when she could compare the facts of what she knew had been the case versus the story that was being told about it, she was able to recognize they weren't the same and stand up and say, this isn't true. Actually, I just made a mistake. For that, she was sort of uh, thrown out of, of uh, society almost. Um, but to try to persuade people post facto, so to speak, uh, very difficult. And I can't really think of anybody uh, who now, was. You know, I'm thinking, uh, Matt, about uh, Bill Fian in, um, I believe it was in Michigan. Maybe it was Wisconsin. I'm sorry to lose track of where they were. But he became um, kind of the spear carrier for the Trumpists uh, on television and radio, particularly because he had been recruited by Sidney Powell uh, to be the spokesman in his state or to be to be a supporter. And when, when Trump sort of disowned Sidney Powell, Fian found himself sort of on the front lines. And as we record in the book, I think, you know, he began to change his tune after the election, after he saw the rioting at the Capitol. But frankly, I, I think it was really more out of a sense of exhaustion than it was out of any real uh, change in his view of what happened. I think he just realized at a certain point that his side lost. Uh, I don't think he's quite given up on the idea that they lost fair and square, but at least he's arrived at the point where, which many Trumpists have not, uh, that, that they in fact have, have lost this fight. And, you know, we talked about it earlier, many of the Republican officials who defended the election's integrity were subjected to incredible abuse, including death threats, having to move their families out of their homes. Was, what is the lasting damage of that? Is, I'm thinking both, is there any lasting damage to Trump or the Republican Party nationally? And what about the lasting damage in those communities? Are those schisms still there and, 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 and the, the after effects of it? It's hard to know. 
you know, we 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 almost have another election season on us, and and then 2024 will go through another presidential election. And I think some of this will become more clear with time, but um, it's difficult to believe that people um, could suffer as much as some of these local officials did uh, in the name of telling the truth and be treated to the harassment and even assaults and things like that, that they were, and it not have a lasting effect. Uh, my hope is that, as Mark said earlier, uh, we found that some people said, I'm out, I'm finished, I, I can't do this anymore, but that other people said, you couldn't tear me away from this now. I'm more engaged than I've ever been. Um, and so I think it's just going to it's going to take time to figure out how many of each kind of person they're at. And also, I think, as Matt says, I mean, this is ongoing and I think it's a struggle primarily within the Republican Party because, uh, you know, the party. And I actually think, you know, we're beginning to see the tide turn a little bit in Washington as more and more facts come out about the rioting on January 6th. Some of the um, at least some of the Congress people who have been firm, you know, Trump supporters are beginning to buckle and, and change their tune a little bit. So I'm hopeful that we'll see that happen. But most of my optimism, John, frankly, comes from, you know, the fact that this very determined effort in the, in the six swing states failed. It failed on every front. Uh, every single lawsuit, many of which were brought up before Republican judges, judges who had been appointed by Trump, the judges demanded facts, and when they didn't see them, they threw them out. Every one of those lawsuits failed. And if you look at them carefully, as we did, they didn't just fail. They ended up with the lawyers advocating for these uh, uh, arguments being excoriated you know, by judges for bringing such flimsy things into a courtroom. Every single effort to get a state legislature to refuse to validate the results of the election failed. Uh, so I take uh, hope from that. I, I think that the American people are not as dishonest as Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani wanted them to be. Yeah, and actually that leads me into something I was going to ask about, which is the blunderbuss strategy. Just explain to us, both of you, uh, what is what is a blunderbuss? I know it's a kind of gun, um, but <laughs> what what was the strategy and why did you call it that? And And how was it supposed to work? And why didn't it work? I'll say what a blunderbuss well, is, and then Mark can give you the strategy because that was his his term. But a blunderbuss is this sort of colonial era weapon. It's a, a precursor to the shotgun, and it was useful at the time because you could put anything in the muzzle of it, bits of glass or rock or you know whatever it is that you had handy, and just sort of blow it out. Um, but it wasn't very accurate uh, as a weapon. And so Mark had uh, the impression that he did. Right. It struck me as a perfect analogy because when you look at the allegations of fraud in particular, what you find is that it includes everything under the sun. It includes everything from you know the lady in, in Arizona who thought she saw the signature of Satan in spreadsheets and printouts of votes. <laughs> to the guy in Pennsylvania who thought that tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of Biden, fake Biden ballots were printed up in advance and were inserted into the election count. So there, these things, it just didn't matter to Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani whether there was even the slightest possibility that something was true. I don't think that they were ever um, trying to win an argument in any of these instances. But what they were trying to do was generate so many allegations of fraud that even a reasonable person would begin to think, well, gosh, if there are so many allegations of fraud, maybe there is some truth to the fact that the election was stolen. And so that sounds like it would work in most cases. What, what and, happened? You know, it, did, it, it definitely worked in a popular sense. I mean, if you look at those throngs of people attacking the Capitol building on January 6th. I, don't, I think those were true believers. I think that they had been convinced. And what convinced them was the blunderbuss strategy, that there must be something that smelled about this election. And are, so I, I believe Donald Trump that it was stolen from him. And, and so these were people who were really, 
you know, fighting for what they thought was, you know, a, uh, a fraudulent fighting against a fraudulent election, even though every one of these allegations completely breaks down when you look at them in particular. It's an interesting question. It's something I thought about the other day was that if we had truth serum and could administer it to the people uh, that we saw on January 6th and the people who sort of unleashed them, and we question them under it, what would they say? I, I like Mark says, I really think that the people who were going into the Capitol building felt like they were doing a good and patriotic service. That I think they believed the president uh, when he said what he did. I don't believe necessarily that the people who were orchestrating it though, believed those things. I think that they were just making a last sort of desperate appeal to the mob. And so in a way that the, the the true believers were being used by the- Yeah, I think the they were, you know, and I think, you know, I, I've had the experience of spending some time with Donald Trump uh, many years ago, and it struck me then, just as it struck me today, that this is a person who basically was born with a lot of money, who grew up with people around him who told him how wonderful he was, uh, told him he was a genius. Uh, everything he thought and said was truer than, anybody else's statement. He and, he and he believes that about himself. I think he's demonstrated throughout his career that he is uh, not terribly interested in, in reality. Uh, he is primarily interested in advancing himself. And so he does, I think, at his core, believe that what he wants to believe is true, is in fact true. And that turns out to be a really dangerous thing when, he, when you're given the platform of the presidency, when you have whole TV networks devoted to propaganda who, who take what you say at face value and who popularize, popularize your, your belief system, propaganda really works. And so in his own way, I mean, Donald Trump is the greatest propagandist for himself who has ever existed, I think. And I think he's had a lot of help becoming a, a, an even more powerful propagandist in our country. The, the, the last part, um, not the very last part in the book, but the sort of last effort is what you call the popular front. Tell us what, what that is, that's sort of the final effort and how did it play out? So this, I guess, is after the blunderbuss didn't work. Well, the blunderbuss, I think Mark may agree or disagree, but I think the blunderbuss was sort of firing all the time. Um, but there were several stages to the Trump campaign's um, efforts. Uh, they tried uh, a legislative phase where they appealed to the courts to say, hey, we've been wronged here. And the courts, in some cases, literally la laughed them out of court. Um, they tried a political uh, phase where they made a, a push and it, it didn't work, but it, it, it's fearsome to think of how close it could have come. Appealing to state legislatures to throw out slates of electors and send Trump supporters in their stead uh, to Washington, D.C. That didn't work either. And so the, the third front was the, the popular, to just try to persuade people with the blunderbuss and otherwise um, something was wrong here and people needed to, to rise up. And the polls seem to indicate that, that the blunderbuss strategy worked because I th you still have, I think, a majority of Republicans who are telling pollsters that they think that, in fact, Donald Trump did win the election. And, and I think, you know, that the fact that that belief could be so widespread, I think just personally reflects ignorance of our electoral system, because the truth is that we know how people are going to vote in America within a few percentage points even in the most closely contested areas of the country. This is why state legislators draw these crazy gerrymandered maps because they reach out to grab onto individual neighborhoods where they know that the votes are mostly going to be Republican or Democratic. So at the end of the day, when an election is held, if a district that has for a hundred years been 80% Republican suddenly shows up 80% Democrat, it's really obvious. I mean, that's a red flag. That's exactly what happened in Antrim County, uh, Michigan, where the Cheryl guy made a mistake. And she transferred, John, only 3,000 votes. Yeah. 
And that was noticed immediately all over the country and all over the world that, that something was wrong there, right? Now imagine how obvious it would be if millions of votes you know, suddenly departed from the pattern that we've all become so familiar with. It would be so immediately apparent that there would be no question that something was something had gone wrong. And, and in fact, there weren't any red flags other than in Antrim County, uh, Michigan. We did not have any evidence of fraud anywhere. I'm starting to get some questions from the audience. Here's one. Which election this year is the most important to measure the impact of these false election fraud claims? Brad Raffensperger in Georgia? Oh, gosh. Um, Raffensperger is a good uh, canary in that particular coal mine because he took it directly from the president. He he received a phone call saying, find these votes. And he stood up directly to the president and said, no, um, I'm going to stick with the truth. Um, it's, it's apparent to anybody who <laughs> reads a transcript of that phone call, um, what's going on there. And so if the voters of Georgia turn away from that and vote for the guy that Trump has endorsed specifically to try to go after Raffensperger's uh, position, yeah, then that's a, a pretty clear signal that they're not as interested in the truth as they are in their guy winning. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously going to be a very visible one. But I think that the answer to your question, John, is that there are elections in every state, you know, all over the country where Trump has put up candidates who are very openly saying that the election was stolen in, in 2020. And they are going to be running against, I presume, you know, candidates who are saying, no, this isn't true. Uh, the people who ran the election ran it honestly and deserve to be honored for doing so. So we'll see. I think that the answers will probably vary, you know, from place to place, but place to place. But I mean, Clint Hickman in Arizona is telling me and Bill Gates, one of the other supervisors there, that it's become a litmus test in the Republican Party in Arizona. The first question a potential candidate is asked it, who's seeking the Republican Party's support is whether they believe the election was fair or stolen in 2020. And if they say they think it was fair, the Republican Party in Arizona is not supporting them. Here's an interesting question from the audience. Uh, some people made terroristic threats against election administrators. Are they being prosecuted? No, no they're not. There's not a single instance, to my knowledge, of anybody being held to account. And, and I know that we're going to have a big debate in Congress, you know, over the Voting Rights Act, which is one thing. But to me, a more obvious thing that we can do to help ensure the integrity of our elections is to prosecute people who threaten local election officials, to enact laws to better protect the people who are doing their civic duty. And the other thing to do, I think, is to shore up the protection that uh, state legislators will not be able to uh, falsify uh, the results of, of a popular election. I think those are the two areas where we could do the most good to protect elections in the future. Here's another one. Please speak about Trump's lawyers, Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell. How impactful have they been? Uh, I think... <laughs> Somebody was asking me the other day, how did these people rise to positions of such importance? Um, and I, I think they sort of tumbled into those positions instead of rising. Uh, all of Trump's or the White House's um, real lawyers um, really bowed out of this fairly early on. They recognized this is a losing thing. This is not true. We don't want to be involved in this. And so I think Trump sort of looked around and said, well, who's left? Who's going to who's going to do that? That's how you get Giuliani and Powell with their cracking thing. Uh, it was just a farce. It really was. Yeah, this was a real B team of lawyers who ended up, you know, flocking to Trump's uh, support. And basically he was picking them off of Fox TV or One American News. He'd see Sidney Powell, uh, you know, talking on, on a Fox show about how the election was stolen. And he would say, I need that lawyer. You know, she gets it. You know, yeah. she'll really support me. And then when she went 
too far out on a limb. He had to kind of, you know, step back from her, although he never tried to discourage her from continuing to spread her, her crazy theories. And then down at the local level, I mean, you weren't having top flight uh, traditional white collar Republican lawyers defending Trump's case. You had, you know, I think talk show hosts who also had a law degree, who saw an opportunity to draw attention to themselves, uh, to pick up the flag that the, that the more traditional lawyers were refusing to carry. So I think a lot of these folks, frankly, are self-promoters uh, looking for attention. Uh, Jesse Banal, who's arguing Trump's case right now in courts around the country, is the guy they sent to Nevada to lead this uh, charge because he was recruited from a little law firm in Arlington, Virginia, because he had been an ardent Trumpist. So these are not these are not top flight legal talents. These are propagandists and partisans. And some more questions coming in. Do you think the hold Trump has on some voters will begin to wear off this year, especially if the uh, January 6th hearings are held in prime time? I certainly hope so. I mean, I, I would hope that if Americans cannot be horrified by the president of the United States convening a mob outside the White House and directing them to attack you know, our capital, and, and, and then they go off and do it. I mean, if that's not enough to, to horrify honest people, honest Americans, then I despair for my country. As a counterpoint to that, I would say, I, I, I just cannot bet against Donald Trump's appeal to the masses. We've seen it over and over again, things that should have been too embarrassing to be accounted. Um, he survives and carries on. And I think he has a shrinking um, support, but hardening at the same time. And uh, that seems to be something he's embraced. So who, who knows? Yeah, Matt raises a good point. But I should point out that, you know, that a, a lot of people who are crying fraud in Arizona because Trump surprisingly lost Maricopa County, which is the basic you know, voting center in Arizona around Phoenix. I mean, he spent four years insulting the most beloved political figure in Arizona, John McCain, insulting him for the very actions that he took in Vietnam in service of the country that got him shot down and tortured in, in captivity. I mean, th this is the guy who did everything he could, both from disparaging you know, uh, Hispanic Americans and attacking John McCain and, and people scratch their head and wonder why so many people in Arizona decided to, to vote for uh, Joe Biden instead. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's Occam's razor. Look at the obvious answer. I'm not sure how you would know this, but uh, the question from the audience, do enough people understand that only 47,000 votes in three states would have put the presidential vote into the house? This thing was close. I think everybody knows that it was a close race. It was a real mess. Um, but I suspect that people also know that, you know, it's a margin of some 7 million votes that Biden won by generally. Um, so it was close in, in, in one sort of technical sense. But I think that the people of the United States uh, made their wishes pretty clear also. But I do think that the point that the questioner raises deals more with how close we came to Congress uh, refusing to certify the results of the election. And the strategy that Trump had, you know, was uh, plausible. I, I think the fact that it didn't work is also very telling. I mean, Mike Pence was the most loyal and sycophantic supporter of Donald Trump. And even he decided to step away from this effort to uh, turn his ceremonial position in in the congress into one where he could overturn the results of a popular election so yes i do think that it's frightening how many uh, of our elected officials in congress were willing to go along and who voted against certifying you know the election results that their own state legislatures had already certified i mean that is a really frightening development and it just shows you how many people are willing to throw out centuries of established tradition in the United States out of their loyalty to this single person. 
a little alarming that we're not seeing any of these things <laughs> corrected or, or clarified or solidified. Um, you know, what is Congress's role? What's ceremonial? What's official? What's just sort of a handshake and what's set in stone? Um, I would love to see before we encounter this situation again, you know, a little more transparency and clarity on that. And I do hope that these public hearings that are coming up will shock people yeah. and will make a lot of sensible people realize how close we came to overturning the most valuable thing we have in our democracy. Yeah. Talk a little bit about some that. Some of our characters turn up during some of those hearings. That'll be really interesting. Yeah. Do talk <laughs> about that stage of things. The what, what was the method they used? How did they get what was the sort of what was their theory that they could overturn the election on January 6th, setting aside the riot? Uh, and how did they get that many senators and Congress people um, lined up to do something that shocking? I mean, who, who undertook that? I think it, it was a consequence, John, of the concerted effort that had gone on for months before. Look at the blunderbuss strategy. Look at the propaganda platform of Fox TV and One America. You know, these con congressmen and women who represent uh, Republican voters who are supporters of Donald Trump. I mean, the most cynical way of looking at it is to say they knew they were not going to get reelected if they didn't jump on the bandwagon and, and join this effort to overturn the, the election. So I think, you know, Trump, John Eastman, the memo that they wrote, which was an effort to replace the certified electors from the states who had been sent to Washington to vote for Biden, to replace them by uh, Trump electors, or to say that there, were, there was a um, dispute, which wasn't true, but that there had been enough of a dispute in the states that they could throw out the Biden uh, electors and toss the outcome of the election back into the House where there would be enough of a Republican majority because there are more Republicans from uh, Republican states in Congress than Democrats uh, that they could overturn the results of the election. And if it were not for people like, you know, Mike Pence refusing to play along, you know, that that was a valid strategy. It could have worked. It's interesting that uh, Republicans as documented in your book at the local level, stood up for the integrity of the election and, and for the role that they played and protected the vote. And yet their representatives at the national level, in many cases, were willing to just find some arcane constitutional way to overturn the election. Yeah, and I think the reason for that, John, is that the people who held these low level offices uh, are not generally paid much attention to. And those jobs tend to be filled by kind of rank and file, traditional Republican Party um, activists. And, and so what you found that this dispute between, in the Republican Party really broke down over traditional Republicans who are part of the Republican machine, Republican political machine on the local level versus people who are being swayed by propaganda and by the popular vote. And I think, you know, congressional candidates in local areas are far more likely to come out of left field and get elected than, 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 the, uh, than the people who are holding these positions of low level responsibility. There's another question. Is there a favorite story or a character that didn't make it into the book? Matt? Yeah. Everybody in. <laughs> if it was somebody interesting, we'd put them in there. <laughs> yeah. No, we, we definitely put our favorite stories in the book. And, you know, I think that, uh, you know, we had to cover a lot of ground moving from state to state to state. So we were very selective about the people who we chose to feature and, and the scenes that we chose to, to write about. So, yeah, we put all our favorite stuff in there. Uh, it, it was very interesting to meet a lot of these characters and and a lot of admiration for them. Who who would be the ones? Who were your favorites? I mean, who who were some of the biggest heroes, and what did they do in their communities to to save the election? Well, 
I, I Aaron Van Langeveld, he was a, a member of the uh, Michigan Board of Canvassers who um, it was four members, two Democrats, two Republicans. His fellow Republican uh, was sort of leaning on him along with the rest of you know, the Republican establishment in the state to not certify the vote out of Detroit, if I remember correctly. And uh, he refused to bow down to that. And when it came time to, to vote, he voted to certify it. And he made a very short little speech in which he quoted John Adams saying, you know, we're a country of laws, not of men, and we should act accordingly. Uh, it since then has cost him his position on that board. Likewise, uh, people like Brad Raffensperger in Georgia, um, he had a lot to lose and he was facing down the president of the United States. And he may end up losing his position altogether, but he knew what was true and what wasn't. What and we found lots of people like that. Yeah, two of my favorites, John, were, uh, I've mentioned one of their names already, Clint Hickman in Maricopa County, Arizona, and Ron Bishop in, in Wisconsin. And these were two lifelong Republicans, ardent Trump supporters, who found themselves shocked uh, because they were familiar. I mean, in Arizona, Clint Hickman, as the president of the Board of Supervisors, was responsible for running the election. So as shocked as he was on election night when Arizona went to Biden, he was even more shocked a couple hours later when the candidate he supported, the president of the United States, went on television and said specifically that the vote in Maricopa County, Arizona had been fraudulent and was stolen. And Clint Hickman knew that if that was true, he was either a fool or he was corrupt because he damn well knew that that election was not fraudulent and so and he refused to knuckle under and say it and ron bishop same thing in wisconsin i mean he knew enough about the election process to know that it wasn't fraud and he became you know the target of all kinds of abuse by by his friends and neighbors and, and so you know i think that these folks i'm really that these are profiles of encourage i'm really happy that we had the opportunity to tell their stories here's another question uh given your your insight into this whole situation were you both surprised by how january 6 unfolded or did you expect something bad was going to happen that day i expected it i actually told my wife a few days beforehand that i thought something like that might happen um and it's not it's not because i have any special insight it's because i read the newspapers um, it was clear uh, what was uh, coming down and that Trump was uh, constitutionally incapable of handling loss. Um, and he had this uh, very hard core of support. Um, people had already been driving uh, candidates, convoys off, off the roads and things like that. Like it was clear that we were building towards something. Um, I'm not sure we're done with it, um, but I hope I hope so. For my sake, you know, the, the January 6th happened last year before Matt and I dove into this project. And, and frankly, before I had really looked at it as hard as I did, you know, when we wrote this book. So I was really shocked on January 6th. I wasn't shocked that a lot of people showed up in Washington and Trump gave a rally and he refused to admit that he had lost. I, I kind of expected that of him. And I certainly expected that there would be a lot of people who would support him, but that they would go to the Capitol building and break in and attack police and and call for the hanging of Mike Pence and search for state legislators. That's something that I never imagined happening in my country. And I think it was a shameful and shocking episode that I'll never forget. You don't hang out on the, the same right wing message boards that I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should mention that there's valuable information in the extensive appendices to the book, which I think a lot of journalists will appreciate, including a list of all the House and Senate members who opposed certification of the election results, a list of all the lawsuits that were filed with details and outcomes, and then the list of the cast of characters and who they are and page by page source notes so you know, really helpful um another question here what do you want us to take away from this saga and from the book well i i would say that the difference between the people who showed up in the capitol 
um, the people who were uh, making harassing phone calls and threats and things like that. The difference between them and the people who stood up to them were that the people standing up were part of the process, that they had the information, they had the knowledge and understanding of the way elections work in the United States, so that they were able to say, what you're describing is not true. And we, we understand what is true and able to make that comparison. So I would say my hope is that everybody, after reading the book uh, and, you know, taking part in that bit, will carry on and, and become involved in some way in elections, even if it's just watching polls at your local mayor's race or whatever, just having some sense of how elections really work in the United States. Uh, can give you some immunity against um, what I think will be a growing scourge of disinformation. I would hope that one of the messages that people would take from the book is how fundamentally undemocratic this movement is to attack the validity of American elections. American elections are extremely decentralized. They aren't run out of the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. They're run in every neighborhood and every community across the country. They're run by your neighbors and my neighbors. And so this idea that somehow uh, we are so blindly partisan in our country that we can't trust someone who disagrees with us politically to count votes fairly on election day, which is what the, the Trump movement, the Trumpists insist is true, that we can't count on the results of that vote. If we stop uh, believing in the validity of our election system, we cannot, cannot have majority rule and we can't have democracy anymore. This cuts really right to the heart of who we are as a nation. So I really do believe it's a battle for the soul of the United States. So we've come to the point in the program where we have time for one last question. I, and I just was going to ask in that vein, obviously what you're saying is you hope people will get involved and understand what's going on in their local election so they won't be fooled so easily. What is your sense of the officials who attempted to defend the vote? Have most of them left public service or do you think most of them are staying staying in? I think most, most of, of them are staying. Yeah, I would so go, say go ahead, Mark. Yeah. Most are staying. So the that's a good I spoke with, I would ask, are you going to stay after all this? Or are you going to go? And I can think of one who said, I've had enough, I'm out of here. And one who said, you couldn't take me away from this. I'll, I'll die before I leave this. Um, but most of them just feel like, you know, they're there to do a job and they want to carry on doing it. Um, so I think they'll say. Well, that's an optimistic way for us <laughs> to conclude the conversation. Our thanks to Mark Bowden and Matthew Teague for joining us today and discussing their new book, The Steal, The Attempt to Overturn the 2020 Election and the People Who Stopped It. We'd also like to thank our audience for watching and participating live. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club in making programs possible, please visit commonwealthclub.org events. I'm John Boland. Thank you. Stay safe and healthy.